Hi everybody, welcome back to First Chapter Friday. This month we are going to be reading The House with Chicken Legs by Sophie Anderson. Now this one actually has a prologue before the first chapter, so we're going to do that first, okay? All right, here we go. Um, the House with Chicken Legs by Sophie Anderson. Prologue. My house has chicken legs. Two or three times a year without warning, it stands up in the middle of the night and walks away from where we've been living. It might walk a hundred miles, or it might walk a thousand, but where it lands, that's always the same. It's a lonely, bleak place at the edge of civilization. It nestles in dark, forbidden woods, rattles on windswept icy tundras, and hides in crumbling ruins at the far edge of cities. At this moment, it's perched on a rocky ledge high in some barren mountains. We've been here for two weeks and I still haven't seen anyone living. Dead people? I've seen plenty of those, of course. They come to visit Baba as she guides them through the gate. But the real live living people, they all stay in the town and the villages far, far below us. Maybe if it was summer, a few of them would wander up here to picnic or to look at the view. They might smile and say hello. Someone my own age might visit. Maybe a whole group of children. They might stop near a stream and splash in the water to cool off. Perhaps they would invite me to join them. How's the fence coming? Baba yells through the open window, pulling me out of my daydream. Nearly done. I wedge another thigh bone into the low stone wall. Usually, I sink the bone straight into the earth, but up here, the ground is way too rocky. So I build a knee-high stone wall all the way around the house, and then I pushed bones into it, and then I balance the skulls right on top. but it keeps collapsing in the middle of the night. And I don't know if it's the wind or wild animals or clumsy dead people, but every day that we've been here, I've had to rebuild a part of this fence. Baba says the fence is important to keep out the living and to guide the dead, but that's not why I fix it. I like to work with the bones because my parents would have touched them once long, long ago when they built fences and guided the dead. Sometimes I think I feel the warmth of their hands lingering on the cold bones, and I imagine what it may have been like to hold my parents for real. This makes my heart lift and ache a little at the same time. The house creaks loudly as it leans over until the front window is right above me. Baba pokes her head out and smiles, Lunch is ready. I've made a feast of shiki and black bagels. Enough for Jack, too. My stomach rumbles as the smell of cabbage soup and fresh baked bread hits my nose. Just the gate hinge, then I'm done. I pick up a foot bone, wire it back into place, and look around for Jack. He's picking at a weathered piece of rock underneath a dried up heather bush probably hoping to find a wood louse or a beetle. Jack, I call and he tilts his head up. One of his silver eyes flashes as it catches the light. He bounds towards me in an ungainly cross between flying and jumping. And he lands on my shoulder and tries to push something into my ear. Uh, Get off. My hands dart up to cover my ear. Jack's always stashing food to save for later. I don't know why he thinks my ears are a good hiding place. He forces the thing into my fingers instead. It's something small and dry and crispy, and I pull my hand down to look at it. It's a crumpled, broken spider. Thanks, Jack. I drop the carcass into my pocket, and I know he means well sharing his food, but I've really had enough of dead things. Come on. I shake my head and sigh. Bob has made a feast for two people and a jackdaw. A jackdaw is like a bird from like the crow family. 
I turn and I look at the town far below us. All those houses snuggled close together, keeping each other company in this cold, cold, lonely place. I wish my house was a normal house, down there with the living. I wish my family was a normal family too. But my house has chicken legs. And my grandmother is a yaga and a guardian of the gate between this world and the next. So my wishes are as hollow as the skulls on this fence. Okay, chapter one, guiding the dead. I light the candles in the skulls at dusk. An orange glow flickers out from their empty eye sockets, beckoning the dead. They appear on the horizon like mist and they take shape as they stumble over the rocky ground toward the house. When I was younger, I used to try to guess what their lives had been like or what pets they may have had. But now that I'm 12 years old, I'm really bored of that game. My gaze is drawn to the lights of the town glistening far below, a universe of possibilities. I jump as Jack swoops out of the darkness and lands on the windowsill next to me. His claws click against the wood and he ruffles his feathers. It sounds like the wind in the trees and I think of the freedom in the air. Oh, I wish I could fly down there, Jack. I stroke the back of his neck and spend an evening with the living. I think of all the things the living might be doing, things that I've only read about in books, but could actually do if I was down there. Run races or play games with other children, watch a show in a theater surrounded by warm, smiling faces. Marenka, Baba calls, and the window, and the window blinks shut. Coming, Baba. I throw on my headscarf and run to the door. I should be there to greet the dead with her, to watch as she guides them through the gate. After all, it's a serious responsibility. And I have to focus and I have to learn the ways so I can do it on my own one day. I really don't want to think about that day. Baba says it's my destiny to become the next guardian. And when I do, my first duty is to guide her through the gate. Whew. A shudder bursts through my chest and I shake it off. Like I said, I don't want to think about that day. Baba is stirring a great cauldron of borscht over a roaring fire. That's like a beet soup. Um, she turns and smiles as I enter the room, an excited twinkle in her eye. You look lovely, my Chalka. Are you ready? I nod and I force a smile, wishing I loved guiding as much as she did. Look, Baba glances at her chair where a violin sits, freshly strung and polished. I finally got around to mending it. I hope one of the dead will play us some fresh tunes. Well, that would be nice. The prospect of new music um, has excited me, not for so long, but these days, no matter which of her old musical instruments Baba fixes up, the night sped guiding all feel the same. Shall I pour the kvass? I look at the table where an army of stout glasses is waiting to be filled with a dark, pungent drink. Yes, please, Baba nods, and I push my way through the steamy, sour smells as she wails a song off key, um, swaying a spoonful of bright red beetroot soup up to her lips. More garlic, she mutters, and throws a handful of raw cloves into the mix. I open a bottle and pour the kvass. Its yeasty stench plumes into the air, mixing effortlessly uh, with the reek of the soup, and I watch the creamy colored bubbles rise through the dark brown liquid and erupt into a thick, foamy froth at the surface. I'm going to be honest, that might not sound that appetizing to me. One by one, the bubbles pop and disappear, just like the dead will all vanish at the end of the night. It seems so pointless getting to know the dead when you're never going to see them again. But it's our duty as Yaga, living in this Yaga house, to talk to them and give them one last wonderful evening.
uh, reliving their memories and celebrating their lives before they pass through the gate and when they return to the stars. They're here, Baba exclaims as she sweeps across the rooms, arms outstretched. An old man is hovering in the doorway. He's faint and he's wispy, a sure sign he's expected this for some time. It won't take long for him to pass through the gate. Baba talks to him softly in the language of the dead. I fill the table, bowls and spoons and thick black bread and a basket of dill, pots of sour cream and horseradish, mushroom dumplings, an assortment of tiny glasses, and a large bottle of spirit trost, a fiery drink for the dead. Baba says it's named trost after a walking stick because it helps the dead on their journey. I try to listen to them, try to focus and understand what they're saying, but the language of the dead evades me. I've always found it more difficult than languages of the living, which I pick up as easily as shells on the beach. My mind keeps drifting down to that town so far away. The way it curves around the narrow end of the lake, I've seen the living go out on little fishing boats in the morning in groups of two or three, and I wonder what it would be like to row one with a friend. We could go all the way to the island in the middle and explore it together, maybe build a fire or camp under the stars. Baba nudges me and gent nudges me gently as she helps the old man into a chair. Would you get a bowl of borscht for our guest, please? More dead flood in. Daydreams loiter at the edge of my mind as I serve, arrange chairs, and bring cushions and try to reassure the dead with smiles and nods. Soon they relax, warmed by food and drink and the lick of the crackle of flames in the hearth. The house gives them energy and they become more solid until almost they seem alive. Well, almost. Laughter echoes around the rafters and the house murmurs with satisfaction as the dead reminisce about their prides and joys and sigh at their sorrows and regrets. The house lives for the dead, Baba too. She flits from guest to guest, her twisted old body now nimble as a hummingbird. On the few occasions the living have wandered close to the house, I've heard their whispers. I've heard them call Baba ugly and hideous, a witch or monster. I've heard them say that she eats people. But they've never seen her like this. She's beautiful, dancing among the dead, bringing comfort and joy. I love her wide, crooked tube smile, her big, warty nose, and her thinning white hair that floats out from under her skull and flowers headscarf. I love her comfortable, fat, belly and her bowed stumpy legs. I love her ability to make anyone feel at ease. The dead come here lost and confused, but they leave calm and peaceful and ready for their journey. Baba is a perfect guardian, far better than I will ever be. But then I don't want to be a guardian. Being guardian means being responsible for the gate and all the guiding of the dead forever. And while guiding makes Baba happy, seeing the dead drift away every night makes me feel even more alone. If only I was destined to be something else, something that involved living people. The house shifts its weight, settling in for the night, and opens its skylights wide. Stars twinkle above us, raining down tiny, tiny little sparks of light. Trost, Baba shouts, as she pulls the cork out of the bottle with her teeth. The sweet, spicy smell of drink wafts in the air, and the fire burns a little brighter. The gate appears in the corner of the room, near the hearth. It's a large black rectangle, blacker than the darkest at the bottom of the grave. It draws your gaze like a black hole draws light. And the longer you stare at it, the stronger it pulls you in. I move towards it, hands in my apron pocket, avoiding its yawn by looking at the floor. The floorboards seem to flow into the chasm and disappear into the darkness. Out of the corner of my eyes, I see fleeting glimpses of light and color deep 
deep inside the void. The sweep of a rainbow, the twinkle of nebulae, billowing storm clouds and the infinite arc of the Milky Way. An ocean breathes far below and water smashes against glassy mountains. I scoop the dead spider from my pocket and place it on the floor. The spider's soul pulls itself out of the carcass and looks around the room in confusion. Animals don't need to be guided. Baba says they understand the great cycle better than humans. So it's probably wondering why it's in a Yaga house. I mumble the death journey words anyway, forgetting half of them and mispronouncing the rest. Something above, or something about strength on the long and arduous path, gratitude for the time on earth, and the peace of returning to the stars. The dead spider tilts its head at me and looks even more confused. I sigh and I brush it into the gate wondering for the millionth time if destinies are fixed, if I really do have to become a guardian and spend my life saying goodbyes, when I ache to have friendships that last for more than one night. Baba starts singing and the dead join her. Their voices rise higher and louder and one of them picks up the violin and plays faster and faster. The house bounces in time to the music and the dead stamp their feet and spin and dance, but slowly, one by one, they tire and sigh and they drift toward the gate. Baba whispers the death journey words into their ears and she kisses their cheeks and they sink into the darkness, smiling as they float away. When the first light of dawn dims the stars above, there's only one left, a young girl wrapped in one of Baba's black and red shawls, staring into the fire. The young, they always find it the hardest to pass through the gate. It seems unfair that their time spent on earth was so short. Baba says it's not how long a life, it's how sweet a life that counts. She says some souls learned what they've come here to learn quickly and others take their time. I don't see why we can't all have long, sweet lives, lessons aside. <clears throat> Baba gives the child sugared almonds, holds her close and whispers into her um, ear words that I don't understand. And eventually the girl nods and, and lets Baba guide her through the gate. As the girl drifts away, pale golden rays of sunlight fall through the skylight and the gate disappears. The skylights blink shut and the house sighs. Baba dabs a tear from the corner of her eyes. Although when she turns to me, she's smiling, so I'm not sure if she's happy or sad. Coco? She asks, her mind still stuck in the language of the dead. Yes, please, I nod and begin to clear away the dishes. Did you listen to the astronomer who had a star named after her? Baba's face just lights up as she reverts to our usual chatter. I guided a stargazer to the stars. I try to picture all the faces of the dead and work out who she might have been, but I have no idea. I still find the language of the dead really difficult. Well, you understood it when I said Coco. That's different, blood rushes to my cheeks. Coco is just one word. The dead talk way too fast. Baba passes me a mug filled to the brim with hot, sweet cocoa, and she sits in her chair by the fire. What shall we read this morning? I slide off my headscarf and sit on the floor cushion and lean against Baba's knees. She always reads to me before we go to bed in our morning. Will you tell me a story about my parents instead? I ask. Baba strokes my hair. Which one would you like to hear? How they met. Again? She asks. Again, I nod. Well, Baba takes a sip of cocoa. You know, both your parents were from ancient Yaga families with ancestors stretching all the way back to the first Yaga of the Russian steppes. Jack carefully folds a piece of honey bread into the fabric of my skirt and I stroke the soft feathers on the side of his face. Your mother's house had been galloping from the Swiss Alps in the east and your father's house from the Australian Alps in the west. I'm sorry, the Austrian Alps in the west, 
Without warning, both houses suddenly turned south and settled on, on the outskirts of Venice for the night to soak their legs in the water. Their house's feet were so hot from running, I prompt. Yes, and the water sizzled and steamed in the moonlight, Baba smiled. Your mother looked out her window and was so taken with the beauty of the city that she snuck out and borrowed a gondola so she could explore the canals in the quiet of the night. I imagine my mother floating over a smooth, dark, reflected sky, which gently sloshes against her boat as she strokes her oar through the starry waters. Not far away, Baba taps her foot on the floor rhythmically. Your father, also taken with the beauty of the city, was dancing on the roof of his house. I laugh. <laughs> he still lived with his parents. Baba nods. Your mother had been living in a Yaga house of her own for years, but your father still lived with his Yaga parents. My father saw my mother, leaned over for a closer look. I wait for Baba to finish my sentence. She leans over me like a father leaning over the roof, like my father leaning, leaning over the roof of his house. Your father tripped and plummeted down into the canal. And then he landed hard in your mother's boat. It rocked so much, your mother fell into the water screaming. And then my father dived in to save her, I rush in. But he tripped again as he jumped out of the gondola, banged his head, and ended up unconscious in the canal. Baba rests her hand on my shoulder, and your mother ended up saving him. Then they fell in love and had me, I smile. Well, that was years later, but yes, they had you. You were their world, Marenka. They loved you so much. I sigh and I put my empty mug down. I love that story, not because of the moonlit canals or the dancing on the roof or the falling in the water and being saved, although those are all very good bits. I love that story because my mother broke the rules. Sneaking out of the house and stealing a gondola in the middle of the night, nothing bad happened because of it. And I love the idea that one day, completely out of the blue, someone or something could be hurtling down from the sky and change my life forever. And that is the end of chapter one of The House with Chicken Legs by Sophie Anderson. All right, thanks for hanging with me this week, guys. Um, and again, I'll see you next time. All right, bye.